a shinobi, his young master, and the man who separates them. This is how Sekiro begins. So you're awake. Looks like death is not your fate, just yet. The old man speaking is named Bushi, who is a hermit in an abandoned temple. While the player character was unconscious, the teaser trailer for Shadows Die Twice took place and Bushi fashioned for us a new limb. This prosthetic arm is called a Ningishu, or as the hermit puts it, the perfect fangs for a one-armed wolf. You'll learn to appreciate its worth. And so, we're aptly named Sekiro, the wolf who is one half of a pair. It's really clever wordplay, as the missing half of a pair could be referring to the arm we lost, but it could also be referring to the young lord that was taken from us in the beginning. In both senses of the word, we play as a character who is defined by his missing half. So I felt it's only fitting that we split this video in two. Just like the name Sekiro, one video for the story of our missing lord, and one video for the gameplay implications of our prosthetic arm. Because this arm can be fitted with many different attachments, and we know of five so far. So first, the axe. It's thrown into our own hand here to crush the guards of shield-bearing enemies, you know, just like in Dark Souls 3, leaving them open to a critical strike. But our second attachment, the one after this, is far more innovative. It's a grappling hook. And if I had to guess, I bet we lock onto available roofs and ledges with R3. You know, just like we lock onto enemies. Because later in the trailer, we see the character lock onto an enemy and do a grappling hook attack onto them as well. So, as game changing as it is to grappling hook an enemy and dash onto them, it has even more implications when you think about level design. Because it opens up this level of verticality to the maps that we've literally never experienced in Souls before. It's gonna be so sick, because when you think about it, Souls is really limited by ladders and fall damage, but in the time it takes you to climb a ladder in Dark Souls, you would have already scaled that height in Sekiro and had extra time left over to leap off of the ledge, ambushing an enemy far below, all in the blink of an eye. So just really huge gameplay implications there, but moving on. The third attachment has us swiftly unsheath a steel conical hat as a sort of emergency temporary shield. Uh, this implies that some attacks can't be deflected with our sword, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But the fourth attachment you might have missed. You see it when our character scatters small fireworks before the horse, startling it. A better angle of this move is actually seen in this screenshot here, where you can actually see the firecracker blinding an enemy. And finally, the fifth attachment. It's not actually seen in the trailer, but I doubt anyone's gonna be surprised by what this cannon attachment does. It reminds me a lot of Guts' hand cannon arm from Berserk, actually. And thinking about this prosthetic arm, it is good to know that they're still going strong with their Berserk inspiration. So if it isn't blatantly obvious already, Sekiro is clearly Souls-like. It's surely the game that Miyazaki said would comply with the expectations of fans in a straightforward manner. It has all the telltale signs, it's got a nameless protagonist for character customization, it has an emphasis on difficulty that kills you, and it also has combat that's been tweaked just enough to make it distinct from other titles. And I think I've figured out what makes it largely distinct from Souls and Bloodborne, although I could be wrong. But think about Bloodborne for example, what's at the core of its combat? It's the insanely quick dash ability. And what about Dark Souls? Well, at the core of its combat for most players is the fact that its shields can block the majority of damage. And then look at Sekiro. The dash is certainly slower than in Bloodborne, and Samurai were... Uh, they were abandoning the shield meta around that point in history. So what's left is swordplay, deflection, counterattacks, and the concept of giving no ground to your opponent. The trailer has tons of examples of this, and I've actually never seen a Soulsborne gameplay trailer with so much parrying, which to me is evidence that we're going to be experiencing a sort of swordplay that is on a higher level than in previous titles. And it's really likely, I think, that the swordplay is enhanced with the ability to use specific attack moves, almost as if you would use a spell or a weapon art in Dark Souls. 
so we'll talk a bit more about that now. Notice how the player's sword glints in certain moments, and have you noticed that red ancient Japanese text seen here, and off to the side here as well? So it's totally up for debate what these mean, but I feel like they indicate that our character might have access to special abilities, skills, and attacks, some of which might only be possible by a successful deflection or two, because he only ever uses them after he deflects an attack twice. And the opponents we face are just as capable of this as we are. Notice how the opponent's sword glints right before he attempts this, this double-handed dive attack onto the player. And this attack is coupled with a red symbol, which you can see is generated from his character, not ours. So it's difficult to identify what this character says, but the symbol seems to serve as a visual warning. And it looks a lot like an ancient Japanese symbol for danger. And I could be wrong, but I believe that it's an alert to sort of help you in fast paced combat, to assist you in recognizing when you're about to be hit by a special attack. And these attacks might have to be blocked with this special hat shield, or dodged, as the same symbol appears here in the fight with the horseman, and the player dodges it there in response. For those with a keen eye, you would have noticed that another one of these symbols actually goes off in the trailer when the player is resurrected. It seems that he really does have to die twice, and it's almost as if this passive resurrection ability is activating along with this symbol. In this situation, what I'm pretty sure is going down is the enemy believes that Sekiro is dead, and Sekiro, the one-armed wolf, capitalizes on this, running really low and stealthy behind the giant, finishing him off with what seems to be a backstab attack. And it's easy to look past this, but look at the way that he's running here, and here as well. Look at him crouching below these floorboards, and skirting this wall to avoid detection. To me, it seems clear that there is a stealth ability in the game. So this absolutely fits in with the ninja flavor of the game. And just think about it, if you had some sort of way of looking around corners, this could enable amazing stealth gameplay. One of the taglines of the game is kill ingeniously. So here's hoping they let us. I mean, this guy definitely has his strategy sorted. I guess that's one way to apply Pine Risen. Actually, a few Chinese historical dramas have depicted their executioners coating their blade like this before a kill, although it's difficult to identify exactly why they do this. So it's at this point we definitely need to address a few leaks that dropped a few weeks ago, before this game was even revealed as Sekiro at E3. A lot of what leaked actually ended up being in this trailer, uh, mainly the interaction between the main character and the hermit who gives him a new arm. So the fact that the leaks got this right obviously lends credence to the rest of what they go on to say. Uh, for example, before we talked about abilities, and I talked about them a bit more confidently because the leak suggested that the diverse abilities existed in the game, outside of just traditional weapon movesets. Uh, the leak also suggested that the game mostly takes place in rural locations, uh, which seems to be the case from the trailer but it also suggested that there is a larger city to explore as well. One question I have, how are we supposed to travel between cities? Please tell me that we can travel and fight on horseback. And while people are currently freaking out that the game won't be multiplayer at all, the leak suggests that the game will at least have a unique PvP system where you sort of enter the world of someone else under the guise of an enemy, and you take control of that enemy within the level uh, with enhanced abilities. So from the enemies we've seen, that could be this samurai, the horseman, or even the huge Murakumo wielder. I could see that happening. From memory, this was also supposed to be a mechanic in Bloodborne, where you invaded other people's worlds as a more traditional beast, but it was scrapped. Sekido also supposedly features a day and night slash dynamic weather system, which was itself supposed to make it into Dark Souls 3, and to this day there's still code in Dark Souls 3 that shows evidence of a day and night cycle. One can only hope that with Sekido Shadows Die Twice they get to deliver the full brunt of their ambitions with this game. And this is kind of the perfect time to talk about it, 
uh, the elephant in the room and the company that will allow them to maybe fulfill all of their ambitions, Activision. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is published by Activision. Not Namco Bandai or Sony as before. I don't think anyone saw this coming. My first thought when seeing this was relief. Absolute relief. First, because this meant Shadows Die Twice wasn't going to be a PS4 exclusive title as expected, which is great, because console exclusives suck. They're really bad for consumers. They pointlessly limit the amount of people who can enjoy these amazing games, and not to mention, being able to have this game on PC does wonders for the YouTube community. Uh, for me, for example, it allows me to make better looking videos, it allows me to make them faster, with amazing camera angles, and way more creativity. I was also relieved because publishing through Activision meant that this game was a new IP. And From thrives with new IPs, everyone knows that. Look at Demon's Souls and Dark Souls 1 and Bloodborne. The universe that From Software crafts in the first episode of a franchise is always more exciting than their attempts to sort of build on existing stories and inevitably recycle elements of them. So if From Software is happy with the amount of money that Activision is throwing at their project, then I'm happy with it too. I mean, I will be really, really wary of any hint of casualization or monetization going forward, but I seriously doubt that From would compromise on those values now of all times. Because think about it, From Software is courting at least three publishers here. They are courting Namco, they're courting Activision, they're courting Sony, and games under Miyazaki have delivered time and time again. So if you're a developer in a position to court three publishers for the best deal, there's a pretty good chance they got the best deal. So good for them, I guess. Now I kind of just want to know if they'll put it on the Blizzard launcher. So to sum up, what don't we know about the gameplay? Uh, we don't know what the in-game currency is, considering there's no souls or blood echoes, and I have no clue what's going to be used as a checkpoint marker without bonfires or a dream. We don't know how to invest in our own character or level up, nor do we know how exactly Sekiro keeps coming back to life. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if they rethought the entire death mechanic a little bit. Uh, the way he comes to life mid-combat made me wonder if you could design souls without checkpoints or true death, just the ability to keep on getting up somehow and persist. Anyway, what we do know is there is a hell of a lot of story already. Like seriously, there's a lot on the Japanese website that we've translated, and I'll see you in part two for that because it sounds like a fascinating world and I can't wait to tell you why. So thanks for watching guys, and take it easy.